get a notification that we're being recorded. So, um, hi everyone. I want to welcome you to the Cure Fair working group session. Uh, we're calling it Connecting the Dots on Curating for Fair and Reproducible Research. Um, we're gonna take you through um, a few things today um, and tell you a little bit about what the working group has been up to. And then we're going to kind of switch gears and um, make it into a real working meeting um, and hope to get all of you involved um, in, in actually helping us with, with our 10 things uh, document, which, it, which we'll tell you all about. Um, so in the spirit of RDA, this is a, a working group. Um, we're, we're uh, you know, we, we've got 18 months to produce our deliverable and at the plenary, we all meet and have a working meeting. And so we thank all of you for, for joining um, and uh, helping us with, with, uh, with the work and for your interest in the topic. And um, uh, I guess we'll get going. Um, I wanna remind everyone that we're being recorded. I wanna remind everyone also that we're uh, operating under the RDA code of conduct. Um, and we are going to be going over a few um, documents and a few uh, links. So I'm gonna put this slide up here. Um, just to remind everyone, the link at the top is for the working group. Um, if you're not a member, um, please join. Um, the materials that we've produced so far and plenary materials from the past are all on OSF. So that is the link there for the um, Cure Fair working group materials. And then collaborative notes from today are um, also mentioned here. I um, want to mention that um, your mic should um, be muted um, when you enter the meeting, but do feel free to um, unmute and ask questions. Um, we'll pause at certain periods of time to, to make that, um, you know, to, to invite you to participate, but um, we're a small enough group that I think if you have a question or a comment, it's okay to chime in. Um, uh, you can also obviously um, add uh, questions or comments in the chat. Um, and we recommend that you have the chat button open and the participants open. The participants will allow you to raise hands. And uh, we've got uh, Mandy here uh, looking at our chat and our participants and she'll monitor that. Of course, if you have any other reactions that you'd like to share uh, via Zoom, you can you could do that as well. So um, the agenda for today is we're gonna do a brief introduction of the working group, the objectives that we have and the case statement. Um, we'll kind of take you through our journey a little bit of how we got to where we are right now. Um, we'll have uh, some updates from our uh, subgroups. So uh, early on, we uh, uh, developed these subgroups to tackle certain specific tasks to help us move along toward the goal of uh, the final deliverable for the working group. And so you'll get a update from these subgroups. Um, we will have uh, the opportunity, I hope, to hear a little bit about the history and the impact of the things approach. Um, that's the video, those of you who are on earlier, that we're going to hope to show you. If not, we can just have a brief, um, a brief conversation about that. There's a very interesting um, history to that. Um, and then we will kind of shift gears into our, our more working uh, mode and uh, introduce you to our document, the 10 Curation for Reproducible and Fair Things, um, or we just call it for short, 10 Cure Fair Things. Um, and then we'll, um, talk, we'll have a, uh, the opportunity to do a little workshopping of the document um, and kind of get it to uh, a place uh, closer to where we want it to be in order to um, finalize it. Um, it's still in draft mode. Um, this is version two. Um, and we're hoping to advance it and get it closer to, to where we want it to be. And then we'll wrap up uh, toward the end. So I want to um, mention that we will be um, you, you'll hear from all of the Cure Fair uh, working group co-chairs today, um, as well as a few other people. So uh, among the co-chairs, we have Florio Argelius, who's research associate at Cornell Center for Social Sciences at Cornell University. 
to my Christian, who is Assistant Director for Archives at the Odom Institute, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Tom Honeyman, Program Manager, Software Program at the Australian Research Data Commons, and I'm uh, Lee Moore Pierre. I'm Associate Director for Research at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. I want to give a special shout out to Mandy Gooch, uh, who's on here today, um, and you'll hear from Mandy uh, a little later. Mandy's Research Data Archivist at the Odom Institute at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has done um, tremendous work um, for this working group and has also led one of the subgroups. So, Thank you, Mandy, for stepping up. And I also would like to acknowledge um, many others who have stepped up um, over the past 15 months or so and contributed their time and their resources, uh, whether in writing, gathering information, uh, helping disseminate materials, uh, reviewing and commenting on drafts, really tremendous work. And, and I thank everyone um, who, who's helped us um, along the way and uh, will be helping us as we, as we go forward. So um, a little bit about uh, what the Cure Fair Working Group um, is. So uh, we set up in July of, oh my God, it's a blur. Is it July of 2019? I believe it, it was, um, or is it 2020? Um, July 2020, I think it was, um, uh, to uh, really try to tackle and, um, uh, and, and help explain um, the work that's associated with curation of materials that are underlying scientific claims. And um, the materials that are underlying the scientific claims um, are not, uh, we consider them as a package. Um, another term for that is a compendium. Um, and those include uh, oftentimes data, code, uh, code book, um, work, work uh, uh, pipelines, um, other kinds of scripts, um, other documentation. Um, all of these materials that um, come together to form a package or a compendium that um, when, um, when, when, you, when you interact all of these materials, um, then you will be able to reproduce the reported scientific claim. Okay, so it's long story, uh, or, or you know, say it in a more brief way, it's the materials that are underlying the scientific claims. And by curation, we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by curation, but, but we're particularly interested not just in the researchers who are producing these materials and aiming to make them reproducible, but we're also um, very interested in the curation activities that have to happen when we want to publish these materials or archive them. How do we make sure that these materials will be preserved in good shape um, so that they could be usable in the long term? And specifically, how do we make sure that they can be used in a way that will reproduce that original scientific claim? So we're interested um, in these activities that help to preserve and to archive and to enhance materials in order to make them usable in the long term. So the working group is set out to um, try to create standard-based guidelines to offer a framework for implementing effective curation workflows so that we can publish fair data and code that supports scientific reproducibility. Um, that has been our, our kind of mission. And to do that, um, we aim to have a final report um, or a final document that will outline these standard-based guidelines for cure fair best practices in publishing and archiving computationally reproducible studies um, that include all of the associated computational methods and materials that underlie that. And as kind of interim deliverables, uh, number one and two on the screen here right now, um, we also uh, promise that we will deliver a, a snapshot of the current state of practices that are uh, drawn from a, a broad survey of community practices and that we will also um, try to synthesize these practices in a way that we can kind of start to see themes or broader uh, the broader picture. 
Um, I'll pause here for just one second. Um, Mandy, if you don't mind putting in the collaborative notes link again in the chat, just in case uh, anyone has missed that. And um, we we would love for you to um, follow along um, and, and then as well as potentially um, uh, add any comments or any questions into, into the collaborative notes. So a couple of things, and we touched on this already, but I want to kind of be very clear about what we mean by computational reproducibility and what we mean by curation. So when we're talking about computational reproducibility, we're talking about the ability to repeat analysis and arrive at the same results. Um, in some disciplines, uh, uh, a common term that you'll hear is replication and replication and reproducibility are kind of used interchangeably. I'll speak for the um, discipline that I know uh, the best, which is political science. Um, people will talk about replication. People will define reproducibility and then say replication. It drives me nuts, but I know what they mean. But obviously there's a little bit of confusion out there with these terms, although I do think that we are converging on a, on a you know, kind of a state of the art uh, definition of reproducibility as using the same code, the same data and arriving at the same results for the purpose of verification um, and building on top of these results. Whereas replication really refers to using the same analysis on different data or using maybe uh, adding data uh, or changing some of the conditions or changing the context um, to, do, to do analysis and see if the results still hold. So it's a different concept. What we're really focused on is reproducibility that is based in computation um, where you can arrive at the same results. And by curation, as I mentioned, we're talking about managing and preserving digital data and other materials over the long term. Um, and it's a set of activities and it's a set of activities that are that, are, that happen over time. Um, so um, for our purposes in this framework, when we talk about curation, what, we're, what we are curating is the reproducible file bundle, or as I mentioned before, it could be called a, a research compendium, but it's the these digital artifacts that are underlying the scientific claim or a paper as a whole. Um, and what we want to be able to do, why do we do that? We want to enable continued access and independent reuse for, um, for the long term of these materials. So, um, oops. Why curate? Um, just a couple of words on, on why do we want to do this curation? I think that um, one of the things that sets apart this working group a little bit is, again, because it is the fact that we're thinking about reproducibility from the perspective of publishing reproducible research and archiving reproducible research, um, where I know that there's a lot of emphasis, which is welcome and necessary on the research side, right? For the researchers to engage in practices that will make their research reproducible. We have to have both. We have to have the researchers start with doing what they can to use the tools and the software and the practices that'll make their research reproducible. And at the same time, it, um, we also need um, to take care and be mindful of what are the things we need to make sure happen so that we can publish and archive this correctly. Um, and in a way that, that could be really um, usable. So why do we curate? We curate because we want to assess whether computational reproducibility can be achieved using these objects um, that are contained in the research compendium. And we also want to make sure that these objects meet um, quality standards like FAIR um, standards and other standards for long-term archival preservation. So for these reasons, it's important to, um, to do the curation. So that, that's a little bit of a background on, um, on the working group and on kind of our um, framework and where we're coming from. And I am now going to turn over um, to our, the leads of each of our, our subgroups to let us know a little bit about their progress um, and what they've been working on. So as I mentioned, um, early on in the life of the working group, we divided it up to, um, or we, you know, we, we identified four tasks that we thought were important. One is to help identify uh, what is, what, what, how are people thinking about curation uh, for fair and reproducible research? 
Um, another one is what are people actually doing um, right now? Are there people who are doing curation for fair and reproducible research? Um, subgroup number three was, was specifically focused on the challenges um, of that kind of work. And subgroup number four um, was really trying to look at um, what are you know what are synergies and alliances within RDA that we can tap into and collaborate with so that we can um, not duplicate efforts and kind of make the best use of um, of the RDA uh, community um, to to kind of leverage all of our efforts together toward this end. Um, it's even though we are uh, toward the end of uh, our working group, there is still, um, and we'd be very interested in having you uh, join any of the subgroups. Um, once you'll get to hear from the uh, from the leads on, on the reports, um, you might get a more of a flavor of where where they're at and what they need. Um, but that link over here is a link to um, to uh, be able to uh, join any of the subgroups. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mandy. Uh, Mandy, I'm going to still drive the slides, but um, I'll mute my microphone and I will um, let you take over. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Mandy Gooch. I am a research data archivist at the Odom Institute. Thank you, Lamar, for the wonderful introduction. Um, let me first start by saying subgroup one was set for um, looking at cure fair definitions um, to provide a broader understanding of what we mean uh, when we're saying curating research artifacts for reproducibility. Um, so we've done a pretty extensive grab of literature um, out there about uh, computational reproducibility and curation in, the, in that context. Um, you see here on this uh, first slide, there is a link to join us if you are interested in contributing. Um, to our product, which is in the next slide, please. So our um, final product for subgroup one is uh, a Zotero library that provides a broader understanding of what it means to curate research artifacts. Um, you can actually visit the library at the Zotero link here um, on the slide. If you'd like to contribute to it, we have put together a, um, a guide for how to join um, the Zotero library and also how to contribute and um, use the tagging system that we have set up. So we have gone through and I believe there's about a hundred different articles in here currently, um, different resources, and they're all tagged um, denoting what the contents of the articles are. They all have um, all of the abstract information. There's some really great metadata in there. So um, feel free to take a look at it um, and join us and contribute. And um, that's everything. And I'm to my Christian. I'm going to talk about subgroup two that I'm leading. And this is um, Cure Fair Practices. And what we've been doing is trying to identify different organizations that have implemented Cure Fair workflows, tools, services, um, so that we can learn more about um, what's going on in the landscape for people who are um, engaged in these practices. So, um, this has been a little tough because there, there, as far as we know, there aren't tons of organizations, uh, but we try to collect information from as many as we can. So there is a link to join. On the next slide, you will see um, what we have so far. What we plan to do with all this information um, is one to just create a directory so the community can um, have one place where they can go and find out um, where find out who implementers are. So there will be a little bit of information, we'll have it tagged, but we do want more information than just who they are. We wanna know more about the specific um, services and, and um, products or uh, workflows that they have implemented. So we have a survey that we put together um, and there's a link there. So we have 23 organizations in our directory right now, which include research institutes, scholarly journals, data repositories, and service providers. Um, 
and we have six profiles right now. So if you are, um, if you represent an organization that that has any of these tools, workflows, techniques, um, strategies that support computational reproducibility, I encourage you to please go to this link. It doesn't take long. Um, the survey um, just goes into a little more detail about who you serve, how you serve, um, and at what point in the life cycle you serve. So I think this would be really useful for the community to really understand how implementation is happening. Um, and so with the directory, what will happen is if, if there are, if the institution has um, completed the survey, then you'll be able to go and see a bit more information about them, um, which I think will be very useful um, to the community. So that's what we have going on there. And we'll keep this um, probably living because things change. We know that there will be more organizations, so we'll continue adding to this directory and hopefully getting more full profiles for the organizations. Hi, everyone. I'm Florio Argelius. I'm a research associate at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences, and I'm going to be reporting about subgroup three. Uh, subgroup three is about the uh, cure fair challenges. Uh, the aim of subgroup three is to describe the challenges of preparing and reusing materials required for computational reproducibility. Uh, the group has uh, reviewed the literature and collected use cases, stories, and interviews with various stakeholders, such as researchers, publishers, funders, data professionals, IT, and repositories who are trying to computational, computationally reproduce scientific results and processes. Uh, we held meetings between September 2020 and January 2021 to plan for ways to collect information about challenges, analyze that information, and discuss a framework for the challenges, uh, and wrote a report based on our findings. Uh, we are glad to say that we have completed our report and is now an official RDA supporting output. Next slide, please. Uh, on the left is an image of the RDA card for our Cure Fair Working Group Supporting Output, indicating it is an official RDA output. And on the, um, and on the right is the link to the report. Uh, we encourage you to visit that link. Uh, I'll share with you briefly uh, the main insights that we got from our activities. Uh, the first main challenge uh, experienced by those who are preparing or attempting computational reproducibility is the lack of clarity on standards uh, for computational uh, for computational reproducibility, we find some variation in the meaning and the practice of computational reproducibility. Uh, the second main challenge is social cultural factors or human factors. Several challenges have to do with human factors at the micro level, like insufficient training and skills, and also at the macro level, like like lack of awareness in some domains. Uh, the third main challenge is the R in fair. Uh, which is reusable, uh, the ability to reuse digital materials when preparing or attempting computational reproducibility is the most common challenge reported. And the fourth main challenge is that uh, machine readable is not enough. Uh, FAIR must be human readable. And the fifth main challenge is that solutions tend to be ad hoc and not FAIR. Uh, some practical difficulties are met with uh, improvised solutions by those attempting computational reproducibility. For example, creating an implementation based on the methods description in the paper when the original code is not provided. And finally, the, main, the sixth main challenge is the differences across stakeholders and domains. Uh, special attention must be given to the requirements and practices of different scholarly domains uh, and, and indeed to the raw materials that compromise an academic uh, field. In addition, different st stakeholders emphasize different computational computational reproducibility challenges. Uh, solutions addressing the feasibility of computational reproducibility you need to consider these contexts. Next slide, please. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, working group, group four is about um, synthesizing and bridging RDA outputs, recommendations, and working group or interest group activities that are aligned with QFAIR. Um, the tricky thing about uh, doing that is that particularly when it comes to working groups um, that have concluded, um, what we have to draw upon is the, um, the outputs that they produced. Um, and when we're talking about activities that are underway, what we have to draw upon is the, is the outputs that they are essentially producing in parallel with us. Um, we are very open for input um, into uh, this group. Um, 
Uh, essentially, you could do that right now um, if there's something that you think is worth bringing to our attention um, through the chat or to get in contact with me um, directly. Um, but where we're at is that we've identified a list of resources uh, and activities that we want to uh, align with. Uh, and uh, we're open to adding to that list if we've missed anything. If we could go to the next slide. Um, the, the particular areas where we're looking to uh, incorporate the recommendations, um, more or less, or at least um, uh, uh, try to uh, be cognizant of the language used uh, in these areas, because not everything is focused on curation particularly, but the, the ones that we're interested in are the um, FAIR for Research Software um, Working Group, um, which is will, which will actually wrap up a month, I think, after us. Um, then there's also uh, the, um, the recommendations of the Publishing Data Workflows uh, Working Group, the Attribution Metadata Working Group, and possibly um, the Fair Data Maturity Model Working Group. And also amongst uh, other, uh, actually, I think Libraries for Research Data is not a working group uh, from memory, um, but uh, one of their supporting outputs that is particularly influential for us is the 23 Things, um, and, uh, and also the matrix of use cases that was produced by the um, repository platforms for research data interest group. Um, is, has been a really useful uh, reference document uh, for thinking about use cases um, or expanding our uh, use cases within this group. Um, but if you would like to add any other um, RDA activities that you think should be included um, as we work towards finalizing our, um, our uh, own 10 things um, output, um, please just throw them in the chat now or into the collaborative document or as we get into the the latter half of this session, perhaps you could raise those in the breakouts. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, that's me done. Okay, and it's staying with me. Uh, and I'm hoping <laughs> that this new method of displaying the video will work. Um, uh, just give me a minute. And if it doesn't work, um, then I will give just a quick um, uh, verbal account of the history of the things. Okay. All right, it's I Hi, my name is Natasha. I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons and um, my colleague Tom Honeyman has asked me to give a short presentation today on the 23 things and the 10 things. I'd like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands I'm standing. I'm in Brisbane, so I'd like to acknowledge the Turbal and Yagara peoples and pay my respect to their elders past and present. So the 23 Things is a resource that came out of the Libraries for Research Data Interest Group, and it basically is 23 different learning resources for librarians to refer to so that they can learn about research data management. So you can see in the middle there that they include information about data management plans, data literacy, citing data, data licensing and repositories and so forth. Sometimes um, when people, sometimes these resources are reading resources, some of them are viewing resources and like watching videos, and some of them are using different tools like a data management planning tool, and some of them refer people to communities of practice. So it's basically just an A4 sized sheet um, that has these things on them where it's self paced. Uh, learning. So any librarian anywhere in the world can use this resource to learn about research data management. And this resource is actually one of the most successful uh, of the Research Data Alliance supporting outputs, as I understand it. It's been translated into at least 11 different languages. And the one wonderful thing about that is that each time somebody from one of, uh, the, one of the Research Data Alliance members translates this resource into to their language, their native language, they actually put in a, um, they change an example so that it's an example from their particular country or their region of the world. So you get this 
wonderful diversity um, and people can adapt this to their local situation. So there's another version of the 23 things and it was one done by ANS, the Australian National Data Service. And I was involved in this when I worked for ANS, which is um, one of the organisations that was folded into the ARDC. And we basically took that resource and we built community around it. So we uh, divided each of those single one uh, resources into three. So beginner, intermediate, advanced for each one of the 23 things, but same kind of concept, same kind of topics covered. Um, and we had a lot of community groups meet around this. We released one thing every week and it became a big event in our community. And it shifted actually, we had massive involvement here in Australia in the 20 23 things. We had a lot of community groups uh, meet every week to discuss the 23 things and work through it. Um, and it was highly successful in moving uh, Australian librarians from knowing not very much about research data management to knowing quite a lot. And we even got a few experts where we had never had experts or self-rated experts in this area before. Okay, then a couple of years ago, I was involved in the top 10 fair data and software things, which was a collaboration primarily between Library Carpentry and the ARDC. However, we did get a lot of other organisations come on board uh, with this process. Um, and we basically uh, had a global sprint to develop these top 10 resources. So the topics, again, uh, were related to whatever the sprinters wanted to develop um, as a top 10 thing. And you can see some of the examples there. And it wasn't a global sprint. So it was held over several days. And for example, we start in Australia. And when we all went to bed, we handed it to the US and they took it from there. And then they handed it to Europe and then back to Australia, etc. until uh, groups of these people, when we could meet in person, um, developed these resources um, that can be used you know, by researchers or bought by librarians to educate themselves on data and software related topics um, in these sort of disciplined or specific areas. So just a key summary of our learnings that might help you. I think what worked well was the timing. Uh, when the 23 Things uh, was first released by the Libraries for Research Data Interest Group and by ANS as well, really there wasn't a lot of knowledge um, in the library community about research data management back in 2015. It was still a relatively new topic, so that timing was quite important. There weren't a lot of resources out there. Also, the variety of topics is very important. Participants really like choice. They like to choose what topics they want to uh, read around or, or explore a tool around, and they want to work out what level they want to engage in beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Self-paced learning resources are great, especially um, at the moment. Um, you know, it's something that people can do to improve uh, their knowledge of a topic, you know, at their own uh, leisure and, and time in their own way. Also having activity based exercises, not just reading. So of the things don't, it's better to say, try this tool or read this thing and then think about this and, you know, write a blog on it or contribute uh, to a group posting on this. That is a better thing than just a sort of passive activity of reading this thing. Also, what didn't work so well, I think 23 is too many for some people, um, uh, but again, they have the choice there, so they can choose to just do 10 of them or five of them. Um, some topics for the 10 things that we did needed more editing afterwards than others. Um, and so Chris Erdman and I had to put, uh, Chris Erdman from Library Carpentry and I had to put in uh, more work than we thought on some of, on editing some of those um, resources that came out of the sprint. Also coordinating the sprint was a little bit challenging in terms of the time zones, et cetera. And um, active community involvement, if you're gonna do a big um, you know, uh, thing around it, similar to the way ANS uh, did in engaging the community, that takes a massive amount of time and effort, um, really uh, a lot. So I would suggest just going for the, uh, the type of resource that came out of the Libraries for Research Data Interest Group. So I hope this has been useful for you and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I hope you enjoy the rest of the plenary. Thanks for the opportunity, bye.
And now I think we're just going to shift back to our slide deck to talk about um, what the 10 uh, QFR things will mean. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I'm so glad that it worked. That was that was great. And thank you to Natasha for, for her presentation. That was fantastic. And uh, it was, I, I, I'll just say, I thought it was um, instructive to hear, you know, sort of her, the lessons, the takeaways, and uh, the, um, the effort that it took to coordinate a community and to really have participation from the community in, in creating the things. And so um, I think we, we took a slightly different approach and we'll see how it all works out. But um, let's turn to a little bit uh, more details about um, where we are and what we're doing. So um, we, we figured that 10 is a great number. Um, we we um, weren't sure we're gonna have exactly 10, but it just so worked out. So yay, nice round number. Um, but that said, you know, we are open to, uh, to your feedback and your input. Um, if you think that there's something that is, um, you know, missing that, that is uh, really necessary, or if you think, think that things can be combined, um, we, we do want to hear that, um, but, but that's what we were aiming for. And the approach that we took, um, which might be a little bit different from what the uh, ANDS and the Library Carpentry did at the time, is to have something out there that people can react to rather than build it all from scratch. So um, we had a small group, dedicated group, that was working on this, and um, that's how we have the document that we have right now. And as I mentioned, we're in version two, so we already had some iteration, and we're uh, hoping to have a little bit, um, obviously, more. So what are the 10 curation for reproducible and fair things? Uh, basically, it's going to be a document. We, we very much would like to tie to standard-based guidelines. Um, and that's one area where we are asking for your help is uh, standards in any of these areas. Um, and these would be guidelines for curation, for reproducible and fair data and code best practices um, in terms of publishing and archiving these, these materials. Um, we, by nature of the group that kind of created this document, we are relying on um, uh, a particular style of research, I guess I would say, that's more common in the social sciences, but it's by no means the only uh, area where, where people do this research. And what I mean by that is typically using quantitative methods and using fairly small data, relatively speaking, um, to, to produce results uh, using statistical analysis. Um, with that said, um, you know, we are looking to expand beyond the social sciences and are interested in your ideas in terms of how to adapt the 10 cure fair things, whether we need um, to, uh, to tailor them to different disciplines or whether it would just be more an issue of just having examples that sort of exem uh, exemplify and illustrate um, how the things work within the different disciplines. So we're hoping that this would be a starting point for, for developing uh, these curatorial guidelines um, and that we can uh, build on, on that. Um, so the intended audience for the 10 things, uh, we thought it would be important to point out um, so going back to kind of the introduction, we talked a lot about curation. Um, while data curators, uh, data professionals, and information professionals, people who are dealing with publishing scholarly communication and archiving and pr uh, preservation uh, challenges are sort of um, an obvious audience for this, right? These are people who are charged with stewarding these materials and we're asking them to take on also some sort of verification as part of the curation to make sure that computation can be executed and reproduce the, uh, the results that have been pre-specified. Um, so that's one audience, but um, equally important uh, is, is a whole other group of people, including researchers, publishers, editors, reviewers uh, in a peer review process um, and, and any, anyone else really, any other uh, stakeholder um, that participates in, in the stewardship of, of these materials and the communication of these materials, the publication and so forth. So 
really what we're looking for is people who are going to be interacting with these materials, with this research compendium, compendia, um, and helping make them fit for purpose. And, and I, I use these term kind of uh, this term um, on purpose because I know that <laughs> I know that that there's conversation about fit for use versus fit for purpose. The purpose that we are really concerned with is computational reproducibility. So we, we're looking at people who are um, helping um, make that happen. So the way we started was kind of thinking of high level, broad uh, guiding questions. What, what do we mean when we're talking about uh, curating for uh, reproducibility and for FAIR? So one question has to do with, um, does the research compendium, this bundle of files, is everything there basically? Um, does it have everything that we need in an organized and parsimonious way? Um, is there enough information about, um, about the, what's in the package and is it easy to understand? Um, is there information about how to use, who can use these materials and is that easy to understand and, and accessible? Um, is there information about the compendium or the compendium components themselves? Is there, is there, are, are they based on code and script? Um, is, the, is there enough information embedded um, in, in code um, so that it, it basically is machine friendly? Um, and finally, is there some plan for reviewing the research compendium over time for FAIR principles and for computational reproducibility? So uh, guided by these questions, uh, we kind of developed the 10 things. And so these are the 10 things um, that are outlined in, in the document. Uh, the first three correspond with that very first question uh, that I just went through. The, fair, the very first question was basically, um, is everything there and can I make sense of it? Um, and so we're concerned with, with uh, these things um, the first one is completeness. Uh, the research compendium contains all the objects needed to reproduce a predefined outcome. Um, I'll not make any commentary right now what we mean by predefined outcomes. We think that that's something that communities have to, to come to terms with, that they have to define and it might vary. Um, but is everything there? Um, the second thing is organization. So. Is it easy to understand and keep track of the various objects in the research compendium? How is it organized? Or do you just get like a blob with a bunch of stuff in it um, and you have to like make heads or tail of what's what? Um, thing three, which is again, kind of this uh, principle basically or, or guidance is that we should try to economize. So having fewer things, um, trying to pare things down um, to make it easy um, and more uh, likely that things are not going to break in the transfer and the handoffs and the stewardship of all of these materials. So the second uh, group um, uh, of things, thing four and thing five, correspond to the question of basically, do we have enough context to understand what's in the compendium? So we're looking at descriptive information about the research compendium and can we understand what that uh, the information is? So obviously transparency here is, is a key principle, right? We, we, we wanna have that full context to understand um, the research process. Um, we, we would like as much transparency as possible. And number five is documentation. Um, I, you know, documentation is like the number one thing in any anytime you talk to anyone about research data management. And so um, we, we sort of, take that and say, absolutely. And in the context of reproducibility, you know, do we have the documentation, not just about the data and not just about the software, but also about the computation and the com computing environment and all of these materials, ingredients that have to go in to making something computationally reproducible. Thing six and thing seven correspond to the third question, which was basically about, um, can, do, I, do I know what I can use? Like as a user, as someone who's uh, trying to use these materials, do I have clear information about what I can use, where it came from, how was it changed, you know, any kind of uh, 
uh, information about the background and the permissions to use it. Um, and so accessibility has to do with being clear on who can use it, when, how, under what conditions, and obviously open is uh, preference. And then provenance is really uh, the compendium itself and uh, the, uh, the all the individual components within it, um, how has it changed over time? Thing eight and thing nine correspond to the fourth question, which is um, all about being machine friendly um, or things being embedded in code. So the idea here is that we, we want the compendium and all its components to play well um, in, you know, with other environments, with, uh, in other people's computers. Um, and to do that, we need machine readable metadata and we need as much automation as possible of any process. And that includes the data collection, data transformation, and data analysis process, but it also may include actually the curation process itself, like the, any kind of uh, activities or actions that were being done on the compendium that also ideally would be automated and tracked. And finally, the last thing is thing 10 that has to do with this idea of, do is there a plan for reviewing these over time? And you know, by saying a plan to review it over time, the plan might be well, you do it one time. <laughs> Fine, you know that that is a plan. Um, other repositories or archives or journals might say we're going to revisit this every five years and make sure it still works. But regardless, having a plan to and and specifying in the plan what are the things that we want to make sure happen. So. We're looking at, um, you know, beyond bits. Maybe we're also looking at the condition of the code, and maybe we're also looking at does has the, you know, the R package updated and and things like that. So, having a plan on, on how to deal with that. I think I didn't advance the slides very well here, but we're here. So, in short, these are the ten things. And each thing is uh, divided uh, in the document into like three parts. Uh, after the definition about what we're talking about, we, we want to be able to say, here's what you need to know if you want to just get started. So here's, you know, the definition and the basics, and maybe here's like one example to kind of take you through. Then we want to talk about, um, uh, here's what you would do if you wanted to learn more, right? So maybe it's more resources, maybe it's um, other cases that are a little bit different that illustrate different things. Um, or maybe they're like more difficult cases. And then in challenge me, um, even more challenging examples, someone who really, really wants to dive in and really wants to have expertise in this area, really know it well. Um, so offering a little more, uh, something extra, a little more in depth. Okay, I've talked enough and I wanna make sure we have enough time to actually work on the document. So I am going to hand it over to Tom, who's gonna, kind of uh, take us through and um, and let us know how it's gonna work for the rest, most of the rest of the, of the session. So thanks, Tom. Thanks, Limo. Um, and so uh, to get into our breakouts, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of an activity first. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna actually draw on the screen. Uh, if you've not encountered this before, uh, and you're most welcome to try right now uh, if you want to uh, test it out. Uh, what you do is you go up to the view options menu, which is next to the big green thing at the top of the window saying you are viewing Limor Peer's screen. And in that list, you'll see annotate. Uh, and if you choose that option, um, you'll get a little menu bar that pops up. And with that menu bar popping up, you have a choice of tools. Um, the main ones that we'll be using are the stamp tool um, uh, in the next few minutes. But also I have to draw your attention to the eraser or really the undo button. So if uh, one common experience in doing this is that you accidentally draw all over the screen, undo is your friend uh, in that case. Uh, so too is clear, where if you've really just made a mess of it and you wanna take everything off the screen, you can clear uh, all your annotations on the screen. So I am, for instance, choosing the draw tool right now, and I'm gonna do a circle around view. Um, I, you may well see there too, that um, uh, when people um, annotate the screen, um, their name does briefly pop up. Um, so just be aware that this is not an anonymous action, uh, depending on how, well, 
it will basically show the name that's shown in the um, in uh, in the participant list. Um, so uh, feel free to have a quick practice right now um, before we move on to the next slide. Um, uh, again, we'll mostly be using the stamp tool. Um, so it's worth practicing that. Um, full points for, yes, decorating uh, the five with stars or coming up with something creative to do uh, as you practice this uh, area. So doing this allows us to basically talk all at once. Um, and it's a great way to have 15 people um, talk uh, together at once. Uh, it also allows us to, if maybe you don't want to unmute your mic and talk, um, but you can interact with the group um, without uh, doing so. Uh, so we are going to use this a little bit uh, during the remainder of the session. Hello everyone. Okay, fantastic. So I think we're getting the hang of it. Um, if I could ask you to stop annotating for now, um, and uh, Limor, if I could ask you to clear all the annotations before we advance to the next screen. Oh, actually, it looks like the co-host can do that. So I will, I will do that from here on in. And if we could go to the next screen. You may have to close the annotation window to get there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, First of all, here is the slide again with the, um, the 10 things. We've highlighted, uh, this is a gentle nudge, uh, but uh, we've highlighted three things in particular where we're really seeking input from the crowd today. Um, if, you are, um, if you are knowledgeable in, in any of these three areas, um, then I would uh, encourage you to prioritize those. But if we could get an indication now of perhaps um, the one or two things that you'd be most interested in looking at um, today? Uh, what kind of uh, area um, uh, struck you as interesting? If you could take the stamp tool and just simply put it next to the, um, the item that you're interested in. And then um, what that will allow us to do is we'll, we'll basically br choose breakout rooms that follow the consensus. So if we get a lot of choices against machine readable uh, metadata, sorry about that um then that's going to be one of our breakout rooms and i think judging by our numbers today we're, we're pretty much going to break into two uh breakout rooms um so please um give an indication of uh it looks like um uh, machine readable metadata is uh, has come out of the gates uh pretty strong um there is one other possibility um if you think something's missing uh, there's not much room left on the screen, but I encourage you to type it in in a bit of text. Uh, and we could explore the possibility of having a breakout around a different thing. Uh, and I might get my uh, uh, co-hosts to talk to that thing if it does come up. But if you've been looking at this list and think, oh, you know, um, something's missing here, and I think it is uh, dot, dot, dot. Um, feel free to type that onto the screen right now and perhaps we can make a breakout that will actually go into that space instead. Otherwise, it looks like we are, um, we're having a, a, well, it's only just by one, but uh, the second most popular topic at the moment is documentation. And our first breakout will be machine uh, readable uh, metadata. Um, do we want to save this, I guess, before we move on? Uh, I think that would be fine. Um, uh, I'm noticing some hearts outside of the box. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Um, <laughs> uh, that's, so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe they're just uh, hearting 10 cure fair things. Uh, that would be great. Um, uh, Right, so I think we are going to break out into um, machine readable uh, metadata and into documentation. Um, basically, encourage you to um, pick one of those, uh, those rooms. Um, to my, how are we going on uh, setting up the two break breakout I'm rooms? Ready to, I'm ready to go. Just let me know how much time, and then I will open the rooms. 
So we have half an hour remaining in the session. Um, I think what we should do is have a 25 minute um, breakout. And then that will just give us five minutes to check in at the end. Uh, anyone else uh, amongst the co-chairs uh, uh, got any concerns with that? That sounds good to me. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, that's good to me. As we, uh, I wonder also, well, I think uh, when we break out into those rooms, we'll, uh, whoever is in each of those rooms um, can explain where the document is uh, and how to jump to that section uh, as well. So um, to my, let's open the rooms. Um, and what you should do is uh, you will probably either get a pop-up or the breakout rooms box at the bottom. Uh, uh, has the two rooms um, and uh, you can um, hover over that room. And I think over to the right, um, you will um, be able to join that room. So I encourage you to now uh, join a breakout room. Limor, I think you can screenshot and then um, uh, 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 we can stop sharing the screen. And if you're having trouble getting into a room, I can um, do it on my end also. So you can just yeah. send a chat if, um, if you're having trouble and just let me know which room you'd like to join. Yeah, so you may need to close the annotation tool uh, <laughs> because you may be continuing to stamp all over the page. Uh, instead. And the trick there is, yeah, so that, that menu that popped up to do annotation um, takes over your cursor and you have to close that uh, and then you'll be able to click on join. Uh, it looks like um, most people are heading into metadata. Um, and I think I will head off to documentation on the off chance uh, that someone wants to uh, join, um, uh, just so we've got a, a bit of a balance, but I will come back and come into the, um, the metadata room if that's um, what ends up happening um, at the end. So I'm gonna say goodbye to my co-hosts now, and hopefully I'll see somebody uh, in documentation. All right. And I'm going to hang out here in the main room in case anyone gets lost or we have people popping in so I can move them around and um, send messages as necessary. So Florio and I should maybe go to one of the rooms too because the metadata right now doesn't have a co-chair. So probably you go to metadata, Limar? Okay. Um, Anjo, Tom? Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't see my name, so to my you might have to put me there. All right. Uh, or maybe the two of us, Nimor, will be in the document uh, in metadata for now because Tom is the only one so far in the document. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I'll join you there. Okay. In uh, metadata. In the metadata room. Metadata. Why don't I see you? I see. Yeah, I don't see you. I don't know. Uh, do I just do join? I don't see I my do name. Join, yeah. Yeah, I okay, think I'm gonna do join. Okay, got it. Go. <laughs> okay. So I joined. So did you join? Yeah, I already joined. Are you trying to go to metadata or hang out with Tom? Metadata. No. Metadata. All right. I'm gonna put you in there. Me too. All right.
Hi, hi Tumai. Hi, Mandy. Hi. Are I you guess two... nobody wanted to do documentation. Yeah, <laughs> that's the fine. challenge of the metadata, which is great because we could use more stuff there. Yeah, no, that's good. If we only end up working on uh, um, uh, metadata, that's fine. I better mm -hmm. just keep a, an eye on the room in case somebody um, jumps out and jumps in because um, I think they can do that. But yeah. um, I was thinking, look, either you uh, and I, I, Mandy looks like she's dropped out, but um, either you are having a quiet moment and uh, don't need to work, or we could have a conversation about one of the things um, and use this half hour to um, progress the work a little bit. Um, yeah, what would you sure. like to do? Yeah, we could do that. Um, so we'll stay out here um, just in case somebody falls exactly. off. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, uh, and what that means is we could um, pick one of the other uh, ones that are a bit underspecified at the moment. And they were, was it provenance and was it automation? Yep, provenance and automation, yes. Which of those two are you uh, happier to work on? Um, I think there's probably, okay, so provenance, I think we could get the information. Um, I'm not, um, you know, completely versed in, in that language um, that, that's used in this particular context. I mean, I understand it from an archival point of view. Um, automation, I think, is interesting because you want to make it distinct from um, economy. And I think those two may um, become conflated. And so what we had talked about before is that economy really is about the individual pieces, how to make those pieces, I guess, clean, simplified, you know, straightforward. So yeah. Whereas the automation is more with the workflow. So when you're when you're redoing the um, the computation, then um, automating that process as much as possible. So one is about the object, one is about the process. And I'm not sure um, if maybe that could be useful with automation. And actually, since you're here, you are um, on you you're very knowledgeable about the software stuff. So I would be interested in your thoughts and kind of what directions we need to take automation to make that clear. Um, mm. So I could um, be able to contribute and add resources and things to that. This one worries me a little bit because this is one I'm least, um, I think, experienced with. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's go there then. Um, basically, um, uh, give me a minute to just review um, what's in there for now. Oh, that would be um, easy because there's not too much there right now. So. <laughs> Wow, there really isn't much there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can already think of some stuff. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so one of the things is that um, uh, there's no mention of the execution environment. Um, mm -hmm. So um, a, um, this is kind of infrastructure versus curation, but um, the researcher may have provided the um, the the compendium um, in a um, in an idiosyncratic uh, execution environment, uh, mm -hmm. i.e., whatever the hell's on their computer, um, and uh, you probably want to transfer and test the reproduction in a um, fixed um, or controlled execution environment. Um, so most commonly um, uh, these days, that's people trying to put things in um, in a containerized uh, environment. Um, uh, and um, so uh, that would be uh, that would be like a first step, I think, for automation um, is to control for um, execution environment. Um, 
This is going to be a little loose right now, but I promise I will. I just want to make sure I have a, a placeholder. Yeah. Um, why not um, do it as a suggestion, actually? I, I'm certainly oh, going to be in suggestion mode. Um, okay. In fact, it's sort of there in two points below what you've written. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, might actually. Yeah. Suggesting. Here we go. And this is, there was a question about where do we talk about containers? And, and since you brought that up, that makes perfect sense here. Yeah. And there's, 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 and there's a little bit more to say about that because like you said, that makes, that makes the package more portable if you have it in that container. So you don't have to recreate the execution environment and all of its, you know, packages and pieces and all of that. Um, so that really gets that, that um, push button processing, one button. Um, processing. The other one is um, usually when you do that, when you containerize something, I mean, that's a really complicated area because um, mm -hmm. um, badly done, people just put everything in the container and say, problem solved, I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. um, the like fully embracing that approach usually means separating out the code and the data um, and actually um, calling on and um, bringing into um, the execution environment the data live um, rather than having it ready to go in there um, uh, but i think that that's sort of taken care of uh, where did i put i think it was under organization i hinted that um you know in the it's a challenge at the moment it's not um entry level stuff um to keep a separation of objects um basically um, one of the things, um, it, but one of the things that I was thinking about also with this is the idea that the, um, uh, you have an order, if you automate a process, then the, um, the output of that process, um, should, um, conform to some kind of predetermined set of possibilities. So if you are, for instance, running an archive, and you want to automate the possibility that you're doing periodic reviews and you're expecting that um, when you uh, automatically run or re-execute um, this bundle and the output is going to be a set of um, uh, you know images essentially um, might be one way of doing it that um, you can check that it does in fact um, produce an image or something like that so um, Say that again, uh, what you said in the beginning. So the output you said should conform to a predetermined um, say set that again. of possibilities, right? So you're, you've got like a stack of, um, of these compendiums. Um, uh, that's the term we're using is or reproducible bundles or whatever. Um, if you are trying to automate over the top of this to do periodic review, then one simple thing that you should be able to do is know what you should expect as the outcome of executing the script. So what will what will spit out at the end? Will it be uh, tabular data? Will it be um, an image um, or a series of images? Um, and um, uh, you know, what, uh, or, or it could be other things, obviously. Um, and so knowing that you've actually um, done this means uh, laying out expectations about what should be done when, when that happens. I'm going to actually make, I think that's um, important enough to be um, maybe its own thing. It, it may um, merge with something else, but I think that's um, important enough to have stated on its own. Well, that's so that certainly... something to compare it to, right? Sorry, say that again. You need you need to, something to compare it to. Um, yeah, well, that's, just because it that... runs doesn't mean that the output is what it should be. Yeah, so you could do that. Um, that would be like an archive level decision. Um, you could store a copy of the output, um, like the derivatives, um, uh, and then you could compare the derivatives to re-execution of the of the bundle mm -hmm. and say, yeah, it's changed. And then, and then you get into like, um, there are digital preservation systems that you can employ um, to 
say, oh, well, actually the headers on this image file have changed or, um, you know, uh, the compression's different or the data is different um, um, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, but you do need to kind of know what you are expecting to spit out the other end. I guess the other thing is um, with automation, um, let me, there was something about the beginning. Um, information, uh, work for avoiding manual processes to the full extent possible. Um, that's really the point. Um, that within the, the entire package, at no stage should there be a, um, or to the, the minimum extent possible, there should be no stage where someone has to stop and read something and um, understand it, or, you know, they shouldn't have to set up the execution environment. Um, uh, so you shouldn't have documentation saying, all you need to do is um, install this and that and, and so on. Um, those aspects should be um, automated uh, as well. Would that be an elaboration of the first bullet point? Yeah, it would. Yeah, because documentation alone doesn't get you there. Um, basically, documentation is like a good first step. Automation is is like actually beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. Is saying, um, uh, like. There's documentation where it's like, this is what you need to do. And then there's documentation as in, this is what happened. And this is the context of what, of the thing that you're looking at. Um, and I guess you really want to be in the uh, contextual zone rather than in the, um, like, all you need to do is install Linux and uh, go to your package manager and install these binaries. And, um, and then, you know, magically um, you should be able to, uh, yeah, re-execute this code. Um, mm -hmm. I hate that. That's a pet peeve of mine. When I go to documentation and it's like, I want to learn how to, let's say, um, use this API and, and then they have all this other stuff. I'm like, just, I, I just tell me like a five-year-old because yeah, they make yeah. a lot of assumptions about what needs to be set up in order to do that. Um, so I'm just I mean, going to goes... put it back here. Um, I like that this follows documentation. Um, to let's see. Um, so there's another. Um, this is actually documentation, um, uh, rather than. Um, uh, um, rather than um, automation. But um, th this point was given to us a couple of times in the challenges uh, document, which is that um, uh, there's a difference between uh, sort of forward looking execution environments where you're like, I, I want to enable the possibility of um, uh, running this on as many machines as possible. And then there's the, the, the backwards looking version where it's like, I actually need to know exactly what the researcher did uh, and what the specific environment was, because I want to confirm whether they introduced a mistake by doing it that way. Um, and so the, the famous example is the script that um, was based on the ordering of files um, that um, uh, was different depending on which operating system you were running on. And it introduced this error, this um, small, but um, a significant enough error across a, like thousands of research papers um, because they assumed, depending on the machine that it was run on, uh, it um, assumed a different ordering of files, basically. Um, oh, I think, I feel like I, this wasn't that long ago, right? That this made the... No, maybe a year or two. Um, what, what domain was it? That'd be a good um, example. Say it was in chemistry. Um, uh, it was an Ars Technica. Um, uh, 
article. Let me have a look in my Zotero. You know, the other thing I was thinking just in general about these things, um, would it be too much work or would it be um, unproductive to kind of map some of these things to some of the FAIR principle um, sections? I think that might be useful. I think that would be absolutely fine. Um, I, I think um, you've got to decide at which level that's relevant. Yeah. Um, the FAIR principles, um, I, I wouldn't put it in there. Like, I think just looking at some of the stuff that we've got in there, I'm thinking that we might even want to shift some of the stuff from introduction to learn more yeah. um, so that it's sort of balanced out um, mm -hmm. and really be uh, a bit more generous with what having a basic introduction, introductory level understanding of the, the topics are. Yeah. Um, that's what the, um, so Natasha in her video, she said like they had beginner, intermediate and advanced. And that's mm -hmm. actually what the three, you know, about um, learn more and challenge me yeah. um, map to. Yeah, and that's what's nice about the community input because sometimes, you know, when we're steeped in this, we don't realize that something mm. is more in depth than, <laughs> um, than it is. Yeah. But that makes sense. Well, that's why doing this stuff is, um, uh, um, handy um oh, i can't find my ars technica link um uh i'm gonna i'm gonna try google um sorry you're getting an insight into my thought processes because i'm talking out loud um there has to be a um there's an RDA group or something for, for containers, isn't there? Or has there been? No. We have a, we have like a national um, community of practice here. Um, <sighs> I'm just curious about long-term preservation. If we apply, you know, archival preservation to containers, I want to understand more, you know, um, what that's going to mean because people use containers as a solution but then you know as an archivist i'm a, a digital archivist i'm wondering okay well what does that mean for preservation are these um you know formats that are persistent um, that we don't have to worry about that um i mean i think of it the, as the functional equivalent of uh zipping up a bunch of files um yeah. with a, a bunch of undocumented files yeah, yeah. i prefer people use build scripts to describe the container rather than archive the container itself. The archive, thankfully, containers have moved into a standards-based format in the last year or two. So tell me more um, about these build scripts. Is that something we need to talk about? Because because I don't want people to default to containers when we talk about automation, that you know, if you were already use containers, there's a right, an appropriate way or a, a a best practice way to use containers. So maybe the build script. Yeah, is so the build script's really useful because it basically describes the execution environment. So the build script will specify the base image that you use, which is um, usually just a, an operating system um, and a minimal set of software. And then your build script will specify, okay, I want to install R and I want to install these R packages and I want to have um, you know, this version of the um, uh, shell, uh, this version of this shell. Um, and um, then it will go away and it will essentially construct an image um, which is which has all of those binaries ready to go. Okay. So the other thing that you get in um, uh, container land is um, many people have as the first thing that runs in a container update all the binaries um, and that's good practice in deployed software in in um, the commercial world because you generally want to have the most secure version of you mm -hmm. know the most patched and secure version of the binaries it's not good in research land because you generally want to reproduce the exact environment in which the software um, in which your code originally ran yeah. um, so build script good um, script that automatically updates binaries bad um basically okay
So, and that this is the kind of thing where we're going into the, some details. So this would probably, I mean, in general, containers could be something about learning more because we know it's going to be important, you know, and it's a very useful tool for automation. But, but um, I guess we'll talk about this too as we sort of finalize this. What things we may need to move into the um, the challenge me space where we start getting into more of the weeds. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that a lot of this is um, a well, there's a kind of mismatch between, you know, standard curatorial practices and um, the skill set that you need to apply containers, um, for mm -hmm. instance, um, and that that that'll shift over time, uh, basically. Right, um, Limo, you might want to take us into a brief uh, wrap up of your room, and I can talk about our mini room that we had uh, in uh, over here. The default. Okay. I'll try to do my best to be brief. Um, uh, we had um, uh, a good conversation. We learned about, or for me it was new, um, but a whole uh, metadata schema that is very commonly used in the health sciences called FHIR, F-H-I-R, that Brian, who's on here, has uh, developed and um, it really spans uh, across all the levels um, uh, of, of metadata that we would want. And um, I, I personally feel that I need to dig into it a lot more and learn from it. But I think at the very least, um, we can mention that um, and add that in document as an example and a resource and encourage people to um, potentially do crosswalk or elaboration or adaptation to their own, uh, to their own disciplines. Um, which also mention, you know, uh, reminds us of the RDA group on crosswalk that we should um, make sure we mention here. Um, and then Anna also mentioned um, uh, and, and added a bunch of resources on study level metadata from very basic things um, like men, uh, including PIDs and so forth um, to file level metadata and the CEDAR project um, and other other resources. So I think we had a interesting conversation and added a few um, resources and a few ideas and we'll need to come back and elaborate and um, definitely follow up with Brian. Great. Um, thanks, Limo. And in the, uh, the default room, we decided to dig into automation, uh, seeing as nobody joined me in documentation. Um, it was a bit sad, but uh, I, I'm okay. Um, and uh, we, uh, in particular, we the conversation revolved around uh, revolved around execution environments um, and uh, the difference between uh, recording um, the historical execution environment and the um, capturing uh, or working towards a, a standardized uh, execution environment. Um, so uh, ease automation. Uh, we talked a bit about the proper place of discussing containers and what kind of level of detail. Uh, we might want to have um, as a potential technical solution uh, to that problem. Uh, and um, to my, what else did I miss? I think those are the, the highlights. Thank you. The highlights. Right. So we are on the hour. We should wrap up. Uh, Limo, can I? You are muted, Limo. Limo, you are muted. This whole time I was muted? Oh no, oh no, so sorry. Um, anyway, we have two months and we need to work on this document. We will figure out the most effective way. I would love for this group to, be, to continue to be involved uh, and engaged uh, as we, as we uh, elaborate and and um, you know refine the document and add examples to it but you know I think we have our work cut, cut out for us and we might come back to you uh, for some specific questions um, please you know please continue to be engaged please be in touch with us um, and um, 
I think we're we're on a path to to having a great resource for for RDA um, that will be unique and and helpful and will also kind of bring together a lot of resources that are out there kind of dispersed and put it all under under one um, framework. Um, I think that's all I'll say here. Uh, any of my other uh, co-chairs want to jump in with anything um, before we sign off? Mm -hmm. So we are a little bit over time. Thank you so much for being on here today. We will follow up, um, Brian and Anna, thank you especially for staying uh, this long. I do feel like you're a tremendous resource for us um, on this one thing and in general. So we would love to pick your brain some more and we will be in touch. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, so much. Yeah. thank you so that. much, Rosalia. Thank you, Wanda and Olivia. Thank you all. Bye.